get started. So thank you to everyone who joined for this IMS Virtual Distinguished Lecturer webinar. Um, you know, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of you. Um, this webinar is titled Multi-Phase Flow Measurement and Combustion Process Monitoring Through Data-Driven Modeling. So just to, um, you know, give a little bit of information about the INM Society. So in 1883, Lord Kelvin said, to measure is to know. And that really, you know, encompasses the field of interest of the society. So the Instrumentation and Measurement Society's field of interest is the science, technology, and application of instrumentation and measurement. Um, you know, we encourage you after this webinar, if you're not an IMS member, to visit our website and learn more about all we have to offer. Um, the mission statement of the INM Society Administrative Committee is to provide the most comprehensive and high quality services to our members and related professionals. So now I'd like to introduce today's um, webinar speaker, Dr. Yang Yan. Um, he is a professor of electronic instrumentation and the director of innovation at the School of Engineering at the University of Kent in the United Kingdom. He has published 470 papers and journals and conference proceedings with an H index of 47 and over 8,300 citations. He was elevated to um, an IEEE fellow in 2011 for his contributions to pulverized fuel flow metering and burner flame imaging, and he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering in 2020. He also just let me know that he has three papers at I2MTC 2022. So if you want to learn more about what he's working on, I encourage you to attend those sessions. All right. Um, I'm going to stop, stop sharing my screen. And um, Professor Yan, you're welcome to get started. I can see your screen and it looks great. Is this the correct screen, Madison? Yes. Okay, so, uh, and good morning and good afternoon, good evening to, to wherever you are. So thank you for joining uh, me for this DL. Uh, I'd like to thank Madison first for giving that uh, quick introduction. Uh, this is so-called distinguished le lecture a program, part of that program I'm asked to uh, speak. The topic as you can see is about multi-phase flow measurement and the combustion process of monitoring through data-driven modeling. Uh, I would like to share my experience uh, with uh, all of you in conducting the research here using uh, this uh, technology. So I know a lot of people working in this and then uh, it's good to, we, uh, exchange our ideas, experiences like this. Okay, so that, that, that's that. Now, in the next 40 minutes, I will introduce the basic uh, like methodology. How do we use the data to modeling to achieve a measurement and monitoring? Uh, I use an uh, example I'm quite familiar with, a uh, multi-phase flow measurement. Uh, this uh, measurement is quite difficult. Uh, it's a no simple uh, solution. His uh, data driven modeling may offer a, a, a approach. Uh, in the meantime, I will also introduce other applications such as leakage detection. How do we predict NOx emissions from combustion processes? Okay. So, um, artificial intelligence has impact in uh, many areas of, of our life uh, or work. So, uh, so we do research development in instrumentation measurement, artificial intelligence obviously have impact in this area as well. And there's a review article published two years ago in RGPE instrumentation measurement magazine. Uh, I extracted this image, as you can see, uh, they call it applied AI method, which are used in across uh, instrumentation measurement in a diverse range of applications. As you can see, people use different terms, they mean more or less the same thing. Various machine learning or deep learning or evolutionary computation. Uh, there's a lot of terms here, they are related one way or another. It is how AI is applied in instrumentation measurement. Okay, so in this topic, I will introduce how AI affected or have helped us to achieve measurement in multi-phase flow metering. 
So to start with, I'd like to introduce this uh, important area of application. It's called uh, air oil two-phase flow metering. When we talk about flow, normally single phase. Here, here on this occasion, I'm talking about two phase. The two phase here means air oil. So what is that? What we talk about uh, here? You can see the image here. Something you may see if you cross the ferry, you will see a so-called a bunker barge. In fact, it's a oil tank it, it, of which which supplies fuel for a ferry, uh, like this on the right. So and uh, then uh, it, on the left, the barge is a seller. On the right, the vessel is a buyer, buyer marine fuels. Okay, so uh, it, it's oil. The, the, the trouble is uh, when you when you start the uh, so-called the filling process, it's not called the filling; they call it a bunkering. When you start the process, you very often you get air, air into the system. Okay, so uh, then uh, all this whole process of uh, of uh, bunkering. There are a lot of chances you get air into the oil, but you know, customers buying oil, not air, not air bubbles. Okay, so that uh, that's how you know the bunkering process creates a lot of uncertainties in measurement. If you look at the diagram on the right hand side, the seller has a flow meter, the buyer also has a flow meter. The, each flow meter tells you uh, how much you you you, uh, you receive, okay, or you, you sell. In fact, we have two receipts. One's from the buyer, one from the seller. The two, two receipts never been the same. Okay, there's, there's always debate, a dispute. There's some, some high, there are some high profile uh, legal cases uh, in the marine industry, okay. And uh, at the bottom, I'll give you an example here. And a typical ferry, uh, ferry if uh, we top up 300 metric tons of marine fuel, marine diesel oil, or heavy fuel oil, uh, imagine, Plus minus upon five percent uncertainty. That is equivalent to roughly one hundred twenty thousand U.S. dollars finance exposure per ferry per year. Okay, a ferry company can have a, a many ferries. Can you see this can equivalent a lot of money per year, which is uncertain. So we need to monitor or measure oil flow rate accurately. So uh, here's an example to demonstrate what happened during a bankrupt process. Okay. So uh, the whole process, uh, roughly one and a half an hour, okay, uh, you can the blue line, blue line is the flow rate in kilogram per hour. Okay, so it's steady the most time, but initially it's uncertain. And uh, during an ending period, you can see it's, up, it's going up, up and down along the place. The blue one is density of oil. Okay, it's, it's constant most time, but it, at beginning and end, you can see it's uncertain because the air get into it. So the, the black line you can see, which indicate air has got into the system. Okay, so uh, in fact, you got 26.7% duration, which has air bubbles get into the system. So the customer's buying oil, not air. So how do we measure uh, oil in mass accurately? It's a challenge, okay. So then we say, okay, how do you monitor uh, oil accurately in the presence of air bubbles? So uh, ideally, obviously, we want to measure mass flow rate, okay, it's total mass. But the most proven fluid uh, measurement te techniques, they provide volumetric flow rate, not mass. There are uh, proven flow meters uh, on the market, which are based on radiological and nuclear magnetic resonance principles. They're very expensive and not accessible, certainly not suitable for wide uses across the marine or, or similar sectors. So the, here's a question. Are there any affordable, accessible solutions? Uh, without complex hardware, it means it has to be cheap enough so people can, uh, can afford. So what's the option here? And we say, yeah, let's try, uh, try data-driven modeling, soft computing or machine learning. More or less the same, same thing here. So we did a quick survey in 2018, that's four years ago. And we did a quick search here. As there are a, a, a lot of research activities going on in the academic community, industrial sectors. Uh, you can you see on the left, all sorts of sensor has been used. Okay. They, they're quite cheap, well established. And you can see the method they used for the data driven modeling, mostly artificial neural network, SVM, and plus some area. More, more complex ones. 
uh, the, the target you can say air oil, quite common air water uh, and so on, even, even gas solid. Uh, this box here, a red box indicate the papers we published. So my team has been working on this. Uh, when next few, uh, you were in the past few years, so we have some experience. So, okay, our approach is to use Corollis uh, flow meters, okay, to measure two phase. In other words, oil which has air bubbles. How does it work? Let me try that. So, uh, if, uh, if you have any idea about the Corollis flow meter, it's quite straightforward. So the flow come into the flow tube, so the flow tubes are vib vibrating due to the excitation of the, uh, uh, the two metal pieces here, so, uh, so control modules. We have upstream and downstream sensors to pick up the signals. So the two signals, uh, there's a time, sh uh, the phase shift, delta T. Okay, so from that, uh, the, the delta T, we can work out mass flow rate, Q dot. Okay, here's a mass flow rate not volumetric flow rate. In the meantime, we, uh, we can monitor this uh, oscillation frequency of the tubes. The frequency F, uh, it can be used to determine density okay, of the liquid. Now this works very well for single phase uh, flow measurement. I mean, single phase oil or, or just uh, gas uh, within plus minus 0.1% or even better. So it's an independent density measurement that's also helpful. The trouble is in real life, in this case, oil has air bubbles. It's an oil, an air oil two-phase flow and errors you get from uh, the, the meters very large. You still get the reading mass flow rate and the density. There are very large errors. But the question is, can we somehow minimize errors by applying data-driven modeling techniques without modifying the hardware? So because if you modify the hardware, it costs you money, uh, manufacturing implications will likely increase maintenance requirement. So the idea is like this. So we still get the, this is so-called apparent mass flow rate, the density, we know they are not right, but we have that input anyway, the information is there. We also have temperature, which is embedded in the Corollis flow meter. We can also include a conventional differential pressure transmitter. It is commonly available, it's not expensive. And that's it, we have data coming into data-driven models. So it goes on a modeling process where you can predict mass flow rate. Okay, hopefully this is, this is the correct one, and the, the fairly accurate one, and, and, and hence the total mass. In addition to the measurement, we also have uh, flow information such as density, even gas volume fraction. So how much air bubbles in oil, even impurities in the fluid. Okay, so the trouble is when you have a model is, is built offline, then you use it for online in situ or continuous measurement. So somehow we uh, ideally, we need to do in situ training from time to time to enhance the performance of this data driven models, which were established before we do the installation. Uh, in our case, we also developing analytical models of uh, gas liquid two phase flow models. So, this uh, information uh, is, can be incorporated in the modeling. So, therefore, uh, again, to enhance performance of data driven models. So, this is our uh, like whole methodology how we deploy uh, as data driven modeling techniques to achieve uh, a gas liquid flow measurement. Here's an example to show uh, we assess the, the technology we developed uh, to measure air, uh, oil flow rate in the presence of air. This is a four inch uh, internal pipe. Uh, this is a stretch tube uh, Coriolis flow meters. Some Coriolis flow meters, they have a curved tubes. This is a straight tube. This again, stretch tube. Uh, this is against air oil test. This is six inch pipe, pretty large. Uh, this video shows you uh, if you do have air uh, bubbles uh, in, uh, in oil, you can see what happened. So you've got a very long and large air bubble and we have tiny ones. Uh, we are not interested in this distribution. We, we want to measure accurately mass flow rate of oil. So, so we, we have done a, a lot of work in, in this. 
uh, uh, you can see here, as we mentioned uh, initially, when you have a, 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 a coriolis flow meter uh, to measure an oil flow rate, and you have on x axis GVF, which means gas volume fraction. Okay, so it's two phase. So the presence of air bubbles uh, makes flow meter often under reading, sometimes over reading. Okay, so uh, by deploying our established um, data driven models, uh, you can see the error is reduced quite uh, significantly. Okay, so uh, we, have, we have tested uh, the systems with different oils, typical oils, special oils. Okay, so, so that's uh, for commercial reasons, uh, I'm not able to tell you what on oil is exactly. Okay, but the message is there. So the data driven models have helped us to improve the accuracies of oil flow measurement in the presence of air. So test with uh, oil always costly, uh, inconvenient, sometimes even high risk. We often do research with uh, air water uh, flow. You can see in the horizontal pipe, vertical pipe situations, uh, and you can see that uh, without deploying the established, the established data, data driven models, again, you get uh, the mass flow rate is uh, under reading or over reading. Depends on uh, the liquid flow rate, also depends on the, the volume uh, fraction, so how much air uh, in the liquid. Okay, so this is uh, the apparent mass flow uh, measurement, which had a lot of errors. So then we can deploy uh, and establish models to reduce that. So uh, this is the traditional uh, coronal flow meter plus uh, data driven models based on support vector machine alone. Uh, you can see the errors is reduced significantly. In most cases, the relative errors within plus or minus 1%, 1.5%. Okay. Uh, we, have, uh, we have published results in this paper um, five years ago. If you are interested, you can refer to uh, this paper. Let's move to the entirely different sector. This is like carbon capital and storage. Okay, CSS. So Carbon capture storage become uh, increasingly important because we're trying to minimize uh, harmful emissions of CO2 to the atmosphere. We want to capture CO2, as you can see in the diagram. After capture, you transport CO2, hopefully in liquid form, uh, towards storage site, which is the depleted oil or gas field. So we hope uh, CO2 stays there for whatever years, then uh, that's it. So that, that's the whole idea. The, the trouble is the, the CO2 uh, 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 in a transportation pipeline uh, could be in gas form, in other words, gas CO2, could be liquid, could be gas liquid, two phase mixture, or even supercritical form. So the CO2 flow itself depends on temperature and, uh, and pressure of the transportation pipeline. So for all the good reasons, we need to mirror mass flow rate of CO2 is in mass flow rate, okay, not, not, uh, not gas phase. So uh, again, for trading, for accounting, uh, for, for, uh, for the regulation purposes, okay. So here's an example here. Imagine there's a power plant which emits 20 million tons CO2 per year. If there's a 1% uncertainty, which can result in 20 million euros financial exposure. I can imagine that CO2 costs gone up a lot over, over the past few years. It's roughly almost 100 euros per ton. This is February this year. So, so that's that. So that makes uh, CO2 flow metering more worthwhile, okay, because of the demand. The trouble with CO2 flow measurement under CCS conditions is that we need a platform. Okay, to establish such a platform is it's not easy. We, we, uh, uh, we spend a lot of energy and money to build this. So this is a one inch CO2 flow test platform um, uh, under CCS conditions. So I was on this uh, test where you could create, uh, obviously gas CO2, liquid CO2, or gas liquid two-phase CO2. Okay, we, we can also even add impurities into the system to test impact of impurities on, uh, on the flow measurement and so on. Okay, so we have a, a weighing method to offer a quite accurate uh, reference. 
for flow meters on the test, also have master meters, again, for evaluation purposes. So uh, this should give you some idea. I have a video clip to show, uh, just a moment, if I can show that. Uh, you can see the last one. Uh, the idea is very simple. So uh, we um, we fix more or less gas volume fraction. You know, the same quantity of uh, gas gas CO two. Then we then we change the uh, flow rate. So it's two phase. You can see the bubbles here uh, on the top and the uh, low flow rate. Then it's partially stratified. Then the, quite the fully uh, turbulent flow. Uh, again, this shows you what happened in the uh, CO two flow pipelines. The flow regime is this horizontal pipe. Again, we want to measure mass flow rate, okay, without actually quantify this exact flow patterns. So here's a, a setup. This is the Coriolis flow meter on the test. Uh, this is the uh, weighing column, which offers the, our reference. Okay, so that's that. Uh, this is the uh, test we conducted on vertical test section. On the left is the uh, errors uh, of mass flow rate from Coriolis flow meter without the data driven models. On the right hand side, you can after applying the models, uh, the errors reduced much smaller to mostly plus or minus 1.5%. Okay, so this error is, is quite acceptable to the CCS industry. We can also uh, measure a gas volume fraction. Okay, that's a uh, Within plus or minus ten percent, so this is in the vertical test section. The, for horizontal one, it's similar. You can see the original errors go all over the place. So after data driven modeling, uh, then we can see we, we improved uh, quite a lot. Again, in most cases, it's plus or plus minus one point five percent. Okay, uh, we have published the results in this paper. Okay, this is uh, uh, in the International Journal of Greenhouse Gas Control. Okay, again, three, three or four years ago. I'm trying to show this video here, you can see it. Apology, I'm not able to click in the video, video clip here. Uh, in fact, the show is uh, it's a transcend process during a startup. Uh, like uh, uh, CCS process, initially gas free CO2, they have liquid CO2 to come from left to right. Uh, so what's going on here is uh, in a uh, power industry, uh, the CCS is quite dynamic. So the CO2 flow, you start with gas form, then liquid. So you've got a lot of trends in the process. How do we monitor this? It's not, it's not easy. So that's the whole idea. I have that video clear, unfortunately we can't see it. Okay, so the mass flow rate step, uh, step increase stage one, step increase stage two, and the density can you see the change as well. Okay, so this is a transit process. So we want to monitor flow rate of CO2 under such dynamic conditions. Again, we have the lot, done a lot of tests, the results are quite encouraging. Again, it's published work. If you are interested, you can refer to these publications. Then we move, move, uh, move to an entirely different sector, this gas solid, we call it air solid flow measurement. Uh, uh, same thing here in this pipe, it was, uh, it's a mixture of gas solids. Okay, we want to measure uh, flow, a mass flow rate of solid, not air. So we, uh, uh, we use a, a circular uh, ele uh, electrode, we call it electrostatic sensors. Also curved electrode, you can see the arrays. Okay, so that's that. I, I know, uh, plus, plus a different suppressor transducer because the air in it, so we want to know uh, how the pressure change, okay, in relation to flow conditions. So uh, and the sensing unit uh, is very different from other uh, multi-phase uh, flows here. Uh, you can see we have a, run, a, shape, a circular shaped electrode, arc shaped electrode, and the different pressure. So uh, then we go through a single processing stage. Then we deploy a neural network, support vector machine, and Convolution uh, uh, neural network. So the idea is to get the mass flow rate of solids. Okay, uh, we have uh, been doing this research for some years, uh, all conventional, but we have attempted to use data-driven models 
to do the same thing to see, see, see if it's better. And this is a test rig in our lab. Uh, you can see that a particle come in from the right hand side, go through the test section, eventually going to a suction pump. Okay, you can see the flow meter here is a two inch pipe. Okay, on the electronics the computer, you can see on the left hand side. And we have tried to use SVM model and the CNN model. Uh, on this occasion, both are horizontal test section. So uh, as you can see, the CNN model it, it outperforms SVM, uh, SVM model. You can see the errors is slightly less. Okay, SVM sometimes you can sort of data points go quite far from the from the reference values. Okay, so uh, that's that. This is the uh, how SVM model and the CNN model performed under gas solid conditions. Uh, for vertical test section, similar, we tried to again see SVM and the CNN models. So again, the S, uh, single model, it performs slightly better. Details of results are published in this uh, RTOP time uh, paper. If you're interested, you can refer to that, that paper. Uh, uh, yeah, we feel quite encouraged actually by the method. Again, we are, we are not, uh, the, the hardware already is there. We've done, uh, we've done a lot of traditional conventional research, but now we just add models uh, and, and the performance is indeed improved. Okay, to some extent. Uh, last bit uh, uh, about the leakage, again, from a uh, process is, you know, uh, difficult to capture CO2, then you, then you go through some 100 kilometer transportation, that CO2 could, could, could leak. Okay, so there's a demand, how do we detect any leakage? And they want to also know uh, what's the leakage, leakage rate. Okay, uh, sometimes uh, the CO2 pipeline also have impurities, such as uh, nitrogen. Uh, do we know how much impurity in that? So again, we are on the test I uh, presented earlier. We, uh, we have this uh, storage column, uh, then we, we weigh, we can weigh the mass. So we, 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 can, we have reference to how much mass loss per unit of time. So we have reference uh, liquid rate. Now we have used this acoustic emission sensors and plus thermometer. Uh, we can monitor uh, the leak rate. Here's the setup, that's the reference uh, column. Uh, here's the uh, actual setup. You can see the uh, acoustic, acoustic emission sensor, the, the low cost. Um, we have a temperature sensor. Okay, and, and that's that. And we, we can uh, create different leak uh, conditions. We test it. The uh, methodology, again, just like flow measurement, we deploy data driven models. We extract features from acoustic emission signals in a time domain. Frequency domain, as you can see here, we also incorporate the temperature uh, output. And all this information is combined, it's input to the data domain models. So we can, we can predict leak rate and even volume fraction uh, of impurities, if any. Here's a typical result. So here you can see the uh, Marriott leak rate. Uh, we have re relative errors here. It's quite, quite good, uh, plus minus 3% most cases. Even uh, uh, we achieved quite accurate prediction of uh, nitrogen impurity uh, volume. You can see, uh, again, it's, it's surprisingly good. We're still working in this area. So the results to be reported in the in future. We feel uh, the potential is there. Uh, last bit is about how, uh, how do we use uh, data-driven models to achieve uh, combustion process monitoring. Uh, about 10 years ago, we started to try this approach we have this EMCCD camera, you can see on the left, plus a spectrometer. Again, that's a small miniature and it's quite low cost. So we have this radical image uh, which from a, a combustion, a burner flame. We have a flame temperature information from the spectrometer information. Again, we track all the features. Then we fit such feature into uh, data driven models. So we are able to predict so called equivalence ratio. Uh, uh, this is important indicator of the combustion quality. You can see it's quite good uh, prediction here. Uh, in the meantime, we can even uh, predict NOx, how much NOx uh, emitted from this combustion process. Again, this is uh, uh, surprisingly good, very, very basic data driven models. So that's 10 years ago. And uh, since then, we, we work on and on this. We're trying to improve, improve sensors, improve data driven models. Uh, in, the, in the past two or three years, we did a lot of tests 
uh, industrial um, scale uh, combustion test plant. It's quite large in scale, very difficult to do and it costs a lot to do such tests. This is a downwards burner. The burners here, the flame going facing downwards. Okay, on this occasion, we have biomass fuel and we have tried different fuels here. So you have a, a imaging system where you get us the imaging here. That this image can be used to derive a lot information for our management purposes. For example, from the images on the top, we can measure temperature uh, profiles. Okay, the temperature profiles have a close correlation with NOx emissions. Okay, so once we have a temperature distribution, we fit such information into a data driven models. Okay, so we use the data set we collected to train the model so we can predict NOx. So uh, then most recently, uh, we, uh, we have uh, uh, made more progress to, uh, to apply a so called CNN models to achieve online deep uh, uh, learning uh, uh, performance. In other words, we not just uh, you, you develop an offline model, you test it under online conditions. So, our uh, idea is to develop a model, also try to uh, retrain the model, okay, uh, by incorporating new data coming. So, it's, it's kind of like in situ training. So, constant improvement of the, the models we established earlier. So, this is important to maintain the performance of previous models under real combustion conditions. Okay, so the data again we, we obtained is very encouraging. Uh, the details here is published in, uh, again uh, in this time journal. So uh, uh, again, uh, my time is limited here. So uh, if you're interested, do study this. Uh, this uh, give you some idea how, how, we, how we achieve so got online deep learning, okay, by incorporating new data. Uh, finally, uh, so we are uh, working uh, in the uh, same area here. So uh, uh, we're trying to deploy data-driven models to the, across the whole uh, um, combustion plant. Now, it's a conventional combustion plant is, is produce electric power 24-7, non-stop. But now uh, the, in the motor power industry, they have a very complex uh, uh, power grid, uh, which has a lot of uh, energy sources, conventional, renewables, uh, that, then uh, the, this constant optimization. So the, uh, the power plant has to be operated in a flexible way. Uh, it, it, you expect frequent start or stop of a 600 megawatt power plant or a constant load change, say 100 megawatt, maybe 500 megawatt, then come back again. And then the fuel is not just uh, one fixed biomass could be different biomass, could be coal, could be oil. So in other words, the fuel diet is constantly changing. All this creates so-called flexible operation conditions. Uh, they call that smart power plant. All these variations create demand for, um, for measurement, modern measurement systems. How do we make sure the combustion process is optimized constantly? Regardless, the changes in the load, in free diet, or start again uh, after a short period of time. So all this, uh, you know, it's quite a challenge for the people like us, like my team. How do we help the power industries to achieve constant water optimization? Okay, so again, uh, we are still working on this. You can see we've deployed imaging systems. There's a whole boiler. Okay, I get a lot of data. The imaging system gives us a lot of data, plus traditional uh, data such as you know, temperature, pressure, uh, what kind of fuel, uh, uh, and this information, and, uh, and emission data. So we, the idea is trying to achieve constant optimization despite conditions changed. Okay, that's our idea. So results will be reported uh, data in future. Okay. Um, there are all very important questions when, when we talk about um, how do we deploy and data driven models in the field of instantaneous measurement. Okay. So is the data model approach really necessary? Do we have to use it? Okay. And a question very common well, every time I give a lecture like this. And uh, sometimes it, it, if the, if the um, problem is quite straightforward, 
convincing convince the math is good enough. You don't need to use a data driven model. It's, a, it, it, it's, a, it, it's an overkill, in my opinion. But the example I have presented, they, they, there's no easy solutions. Okay. So a uh, data driven model has helped us to achieve things we, we can't do in the past and without too much increasing cost. Okay. So in my opinion, uh, this approach is very good to resolve challenging, difficult investment problems. If something easily done through conventional methods such as cost correlation, image correlation, or, or other method, you don't need to do a data modeling. Okay. Another question is, are the models we established under lab conditions transportable from a test rig to a plant? Yes, what is the question? I think it depends. If the test rig is able to recreate all the conditions you are going to test in a real plant, that's okay. If not, then that's a different case. So a uh, uh, related question, the third one here, on the data set, we use the trend model representative of the actual process conditions. If the answer is yes, you're confident the model should perform reasonably well. If you can't answer that question, or if you say your data set you used for your model establishment is not representative of the actual process. Yeah, yeah, the big question mark. Your model may, may not perform properly. Okay, so when you do this research, uh, you need to check even the data set you have is rep a representative of the actual process. If somebody gave you a data set, then it's only uh, like a tiny fraction of very complex process. In that case, data set is not reliable. To validate uh, the performance of a data model, you need to conduct unplanned evaluations if all possible. Just see how good it is under real conditions. Okay, in the field, not in the lab. Okay, I know it's difficult to do, but it's something we have to do. I think this is true for all uh, instrumentation management systems. Something work in the lab, it may not work in, uh, in the real process industry. You need to check it. Okay, for that reason, and in situ training is something you have to do. Okay, especially with flow meters. Flow meters are always difficult. Okay, the flow medicine process is not simple, particularly, particularly under two phase, even you know, three phase flow conditions. In situ, in situ training is recommended. Then you say, yeah, how do you do in situ training? Where do you get reference data from? So it depends on the process. Sometimes you are able to obtain reliable references, such as from calculations, from another master meters, which you borrowed, or you hired, okay, or you, you, you somehow get the data. So that this data, if you trust it, is fit into your model. So you could do in situ training. It's, it's possible. Okay. So this kind of range chain uh, is uh, recommended. It's also like limitation of uh, data driven modeling approach. So uh, here's my concluding remarks. So I like to summarize by saying that data, data driven models has been deployed, deployed successfully. Okay, uh, in some cases, okay, as I have presented, the models we uh, we have developed uh, mostly uh, artificial neural networks, a part of vector machine, say N N, or, or the uh, the variant. Okay, there's a lot of combinations here. Uh, they, they give a really, really good uh, uh, performance. Okay, and. Um, our test so far, uh, mostly under lab uh, conditions, uh, industrial scale large facilities. We are still working on this so that so they can perform, it can be evaluated on real uh, uh, plant conditions. So uh, that's why I say in the third point, the further work is required. We can see the potential, but we need to do more work. I, I can only say I'm familiar with uh, the multi-phase flow, combustion pressure monitoring or even liquid detection. But the potential is that if you can uh, deploy the same approach in other industrial uh, sectors, uh, why not? I know some are being, uh, we are, we are a research, but some are still premature for the work to be done to explore uh, how good it is, uh, this uh, data driven, uh, data driven, uh, data model approach for our applications. Okay, so uh, finally, I would like to uh, say thank you to uh, my uh, the funding agencies, without the funding, uh, my team not able to do uh, any 
uh, research like this. Also, my uh, academic industrial partners, they provide uh, very important input. Uh, without their support, I can't do my work. So uh, that's that. Uh, I'd like to thank all my teams. Okay, many of my team members are here today. So to thank uh, their uh, input to this. So uh, again, uh, the contributions to, to uh, teamwork is really cannot be underestimated. Okay, so that's all for me. So that's it. Thank you so much. Are there any questions about anything that was shared today? Um, if so, please feel free to put them in the question and answer feature in your Zoom toolbar. Okay, I don't see any questions at this time. So um, thank you so much for your presentation today and thank you to everyone that joined and we hope that you'll, you know, attend future IMS VDL talks um, and have a great oh, hello, man. So I wonder if people haven't started or, <laughs> or they have questions or do we stop here now? Oh yes, someone just um, posted a question. Sorry, I didn't okay. see any in the, the tool. Would you like me to read it or do you want to open the question and answer feature on your toolbar? I'm looking at the chat when the bar can, I, I can see your message, but not. Uh... So it's in the question and answer. So it's in the toolbar with the Q&A. Uh, I beg your pardon. Yeah, I'll stop sharing this first. Okay. <laughs> I beg your pardon. Yeah. Yeah, I can see it. Yes. Okay. Uh, question from Saba. Yeah, thank you for your uh, uh, encouraging comment. Okay. Yeah, how do you take care of temperature variations? Uh, yes, good, good question. And uh, uh, also AE sensor frequency range, do you need to turn tune model to shoot pipelines? Yes, uh, uh, good question here. Answer the first one. Um, yeah, temperature, as you imagine, temperature always affects a lot of uh, measurement systems. Uh, Yes, in the uh, in in Corollas for meter case, the temperature is built in already. So uh, for us, it's uh, it's an independent input feature to all the models we we developed. Even in the gas solid gas solid uh, um, uh, project, we also uh, have used a temperature sensor. So in fact, when you collect the data set, we 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 have create a range of temperatures. Although the under laboratory conditions, ambient temperature, but we try to lower temperatures to uh, I don't know, 17, 18 degree and go up to uh, uh, even 30 degree by, uh, you know, uh, by, by control and uh, room uh, ambient conditions. Again, you can argue this window represents real, real temperature range. Again, that's why I say if you are not able to request that conditions under laboratory conditions, you have to collect um, data under uh, plant conditions. So you improve improve the uh, uh, performance of the model. So this is definitely the case. Temperature is important. Uh, acoustic sensor range, yeah, yes, indeed. And uh, the frequency frequency range is an important feature of AE sensors. Yeah, we we uh, we have uh, studied this for the given uh, uh, like uh, leakage uh, or, or even flow measurement. Uh, we we have narrowed down to this valid period. Uh, you can imagine AE sensors are affected by ambient, ambient uh, acoustic signals. So we have a selected range, uh, which is has like the highest sensitivity and uh, least affected by ambient noise. Okay, it, it, it's a trade there. Uh, now, um, uh, uh, around uh, 10 hertz up to kilohertz, so that's the rough range. So this varies depends on the uh, uh, so uh, that's that. Uh, the more you need to be tuned, uh, it again depends on the application you want. Okay, so I hope I have answered uh, your questions, Saba. Okay. Uh, next question is uh, sub, uh, question from uh, Madisala. How do you train the data driven models in real time? And what is the source of the reference ground truth measurement? Yes, I think uh, uh, this touches part of the questions. Are, are, uh, as well, I tried to cover um, as part of my slides, I said. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm not sure we can do in real time uh, uh, training. I think we, we need to 
do a so-called in situ uh, in situ training. In other words, you install your investment system or instrument there. Uh, it's trained, pre-trained, but you, you need to collect uh, real uh, data where possible and you trust the references uh, from independent sources, from our master meters, from calculations, uh, and one way or another. Then you fit this data into, into the, uh, the system. So that's it. Uh, I don't think this is real time, but unless you can do this uh, automatically, uh, that could be real time or near real time. In other words, uh, your, your measurement system has a built in in situ training functionality. So uh, this module can incorporate the uh, new data that learn itself. It's possible. Uh, 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 why not? We and my team, we haven't gone that far yet. Something we could try. Uh, in future, okay, this is uh, the, uh, inevitably uh, this accent will increase the complexity uh, of the software of the measurement system software. Okay, but that's it. So, um, uh, yes, give a go. Why not? I think it's possible. And the source of reference are covered already in the ground truth. You need somehow to uh, obtain that. Uh, for example, in my own case, uh, we, we try to measure mass fluid of pulverized coal uh, biomass. Uh, the power plant operators, they do know, uh, they do know uh, a reference because they have uh, independent uh, RM meters from time to time. They also know time averaged. They know how many tons per hour. So somehow we, we can derive a uh, reference uh, which is independent from, uh, uh, from our model. And that data could be used to enhance performance of the models under real conditions. Okay, at extra conditions where, where, the, where the maximum system uh, are installed. So, so that's that. Thank you, Mehdi, for that question. Okay, it doesn't look like there are any other questions at this time. Uh, that's a question on the uh, chat window. Uh, very impressive work with the multi multi model sensors in different industrial applications. I guess. Oh, you just com uh, a compliment. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sabas. Yeah, okay, good, good. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Anything else? Any other questions, if any? <laughs> 